Good. Um, yeah, we're really excited today to be kicking off the first of our series of the return on investment for addressing social needs in healthcare. So um, I'm not going to take up too much time um, so that we can really jump into the content. And I'm going to uh, uh, invite Beth and Dan to uh, tell us about the exciting work that they're doing at Contra Costa. So go ahead. Great. Thank you so much, April. So uh, Dan and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, uh, give a little bit of background on our program, Community Connect. So Community Connect is one of 27 counties that has a whole person care grant in California. The aim of the whole person care program is to address social and behavioral determinants of health, to um, help reduce utilization and improve health for the high utilizers in California. Uh, Counterprofit County is receiving uh, $200 million over five years, uh, $40 million annually, and a 50-50 matching grant with Contra Costa County. We've internally branded this Community Connect, so that's what we'll be using for the rest of the slide. And our target population are full-scope Medi-Cal beneficiaries who are high utilizers of multiple uh, beneficiaries across the system. Um, and uh, just to give you guys a little bit of information about Contra Costa, about Contra Costa County, um, we're a large county health system. Um, we are integrated uh, to a relatively high degree in that our, um, our managed care plan and our hospital are both staffed under the same, uh, have the same IT department and the same finances, and we also um, uh, manage a lot, many of the other social service providers in, uh, in our county. Um, so uh, that kind of integration has been really helpful for us in kind of planning this evaluation and designing uh, of the rest of what we're going to show. So at a glance, uh, Community Connect is a large pilot project. We serve 14,000 patients on an annual basis. Uh, patients are enrolled into our program for a full year and we employ about 150 different case managers. Our case managers come from a wide variety of backgrounds. We have public health nurses, behavioral health staff, um, mental health clinicians, a substance use counselor, housing and homeless specialists, social workers, and community health workers. All of these case managers are assigned a caseload and perform a, what we call social case management. So people are addressing the full, whole person. So looking at physical health needs, behavioral health needs, looking at food, providing social service support, transportation, housing, financial, employment, and legal assistance. All uh, case managers perform a social needs assessment on a patient, patient getting enrolled to help them develop a care plan, a comprehensive care plan for that patient to work with them over the next year to uh, address their social needs with the hope of reducing their overall utilization. We have two types of case managers. Our CHWs perform telephonic case management, so all the work with their clients is over the phone. And all of our other specialty staff, uh, our nurses, our behavioral health staff, our homeless specialists, social workers, are providing face-to-face -face visits. So going out in the community, meeting patients, whether that be at their home, whether that be at a Walmart parking lot, wherever it need be, um, they're going out and meeting them and trying to uh, work on these issues with them. Um, and in addition to uh, having our program staff, we've also made a number of significant investments in technology, um, basically to increase the amount of data sharing that happens across the county between different uh, programs. We've expanded our electronic health record to new departments that weren't uh, able to access it before. We've also integrated new systems into our um, into our EHR, and, and we're kind of uh, trying to incorporate as much information as possible to create a, a large data warehouse that is, is as much as possible tracks uh, people's utilization of county resources kind of across a number of, of different um, delivery systems. So um, if I could just jump in here, this is April. So. Uh, Beth and Dan, I want to do two things um, quickly. Uh, one is just remind folks who have maybe joined a couple minutes late uh, that if they have questions as we go along to please go ahead and put those in the chat or raise your hand, use the raise your hand function and then we can unmute mute you, uh, we being Marie, and um, so that we can hear your voices. And, and I thought I would actually just ask a question because something that uh, has struck me so far is the asset that it sounds like you have, which was to some degree pre-existing, 
in terms of the level of integration in your system. And then it sounds like through Community Connect, this uh, really an additional level of um, integration of technology. And so my question is, um, in thinking about other systems uh, that may not have that advantage, um, you know, what, what could that, this look like there, just from what you just described so far, or, um, or what might be the challenges that you have to overcome if you don't have that? Well, I, I think in, in talking with other counties who, have, who are um, going through the same program, that, that's certainly a struggle that a lot of people have had. Um, I think it's definitely been a, a wonderful advantage for us to have that level of integration. And I, I think one of the nicest things that it gives us is, is kind of a breadth. We can look across many different systems. Um, I think that if you were in a little bit more resource limited environment where you didn't have that same level of data integration, you may have to be a little bit more kind of specific with your targets that you're trying to measure. And I, I think if you, you know, if you take a specific thing that you're interested in looking at, then you can generally figure out a way um, to measure that. Uh, it, I think that because it's a little easy for us because of our because of our integrated technology, we can kind of pick more things easier. But but I think the, there's always the possibility to integrate these systems, just whether or not you have the staff and the ability to communicate effectively with each other. Yeah, I think two things that um, that that the challenges that counties will be facing on the integration, and we have had to do some integration for some of these outside systems, are you know, can really be broken down into legal considerations and kind of those technology ones. And I think that, you know, there's the process of setting up those MOUs, uh, building those relationships with other organizations um, to making those contracts so that you can uh, enable that data sharing across systems. Like we did that with our homeless uh, HMIS system um, or uh, juvenile um, JMS system as well. Um, and then secondly is just the technology process of how do you actually match data and I think that, you know, those are first the legal things need to be figured out and then the, there are the technology issues of how are we matching records across systems, um, duplication of records and uh, all these things are challenges that, uh, that need to be addressed before we can actually match records across. Great, thank you so much. That's really helpful. So quickly, just wanted to talk about uh, Community Connect um, and how we're approaching our evaluation. So we identify patients to participate in our program based off of a data-driven risk model, um, a predictive risk model that's using multiple regression, looking at a number of factors that we have um, from our various technology systems, from the health record, from detention, um, social factors, utilization factors, and chronic conditions. From there, we identify a list of patients who we think are eligible for our program and rank them from top to bottom. And we I enroll a, a group of patients both in our program and also in a control group. Uh, as from there, as they get enrolled, as they, they go through a basic social case management over the course of one year. We have 25 core services that we provide patients and link them to community resources um, and try to get people to be um, uh, changing their utilization in a way that we're avoiding um, uh, ED visits and uh, avoidable inpatient visits. Um, so I'm just providing a little bit more detail here about uh, our program and enrollment process and, and how we're using our uh, risk model to, uh, to identify those, uh, the people who end up enrolled in our program. Uh, essentially, we've, we've built a predictive risk model that uh, takes past information about all potential risk factors the people in our population and, and link that with their future utilization. Um, that risk model allows us to look at our current population and then predict what we think their future utilization will be. Uh, once we've identified kind of who we think the highest risk uh, people are, those people are those are the people who we are targeting for enrolling into our program. Um, and uh, you know, part of this is, is, is a challenge for evaluation when we structure things like this because we've specifically identified high-risk patients to enroll into our program. So if they end up having high utilization afterwards, that's not particularly surprising. Um, so the way that we've decided to address this is to, uh, is to basically create a control group. Um, if we, uh, of the population that we identify as high risk, some of them are enrolled into our program administratively, and some of them are identified as controls who are held out for the 
time being and are eligible for enrollment later. Um, by comparison, by comparing the, the um, what happens to these two populations, the intervention population and the control population, then we can get um, what we believe is kind of the, the best estimate of what the effect of our program is on and I'm just going to, um, if, if it's okay, I want to jump in here because I do see that uh, Gloria has a question. So maybe she's, I think you just talked about the control group, but she's wondering what happens to those individuals enrolled in the control group. So wondering if you might be able to just say a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. So um, at, any, at any point in time, we have a certain number of uh, spots into our, in, our, uh, in our program. Um, and everyone who's identified as a control group is, you know, basically someone we didn't have space for right now to fit into our program. The next month that comes around if that person still identified as high risk, they are, uh, again, uh, they are, you know, basically eligible to be re to be enrolled in the program. And so their, their time as a control uh, patient ends and then, and then they are enrolled. And so we, you know, I, I think by that way, we're, we're making sure that we're not, um, we're not, uh, excluding people from getting the services that they might need just for our evaluation, but we are, you know, still uh, maintaining our ability to perform that evaluation. Thanks. Great. So our evaluation team is a setup of about 10 people that have worked on developing a set of key questions for our program. So as you can imagine with the program of this breath, that we really wanted to develop a robust evaluation of the program to be determining um, things like how can we reduce avoidable utilization, what has happened, how does this differentiate depending on what type of case manager you have. So we've developed a set of 13 questions, and 18 learning objectives, and over 150 comparison measures that we're measuring over the course of our pilot, looking back in the several years prior to a patient being enrolled, and then what happened to them. Um, several years after their enrollment. So it's a very robust, uh, comprehensive evaluation that we have set forth. I think we've really um, uh, set uh, high hopes for ourselves and what we can look at. And I think that Contra Costa County's uh, really invested in uh, evaluation team to conduct this. So I think it's pretty unique that a county put, has put the resources into the hiring uh, data scientists, several evaluators. Uh, we've had IRB proposals so that we can actually come at the end of this project and have a pretty robust evaluation about what, what we have done internally that, that has had an effect on the patient population. So this is great. I want to um, just pause for a second and maybe turn to Marie to see if there's anyone that's um, either raised their hand to ask a question or is bringing questions into the chat box. Um, this is this has been great information about the evaluation approach and i think you're right that it's probably fairly unique um and so there might be some questions about the approach itself and the way you've structured it so i want to just pause for a second and i love that contra costa county has um energy saving lighting it looks like in its conference rooms <laughs> the lights just went out on you guys um so please type in your questions and marie are we seeing any that are coming in uh, yes, we have two questions that just came in. Um, one from Amanda Clark. So how did you identify which metrics to use? Sure, that's a great question. So essentially, we have a committee that meets um, bi-weekly. Bi and I think at the very beginning, we just put everything up at the table. What, what could we measure? What would we want to measure? Um, and we just started brainstorming about it. We started out with our questions, figuring out what kind of big questions did we have, how would we determine those to be successful, and then just kind of started the process of what are we measuring, what is being measured across different systems. So for instance, are some of these things being collected by Prime or other initiatives in the health system that we can piggyback on? Are some of these totally new metrics? Um, and then we started a process of uh, thinking about how we can link these uh, different systems and had to develop a full data model. And that's what we're currently working on is extracting all this information from our health record, from our data warehouse into a variety of data tables to, uh, so we can perform this level of analysis. Do you have anything to add, Dan? Um, no. Um, we have another question from Therese Wetterman. Um, on average, how long are patients enrolled in your program? 
So our enrollment period is one year. Uh, people are enrolled um, according to their risk score, uh, and then 10 months after enrollment, we uh, assess their risk again. So we run them through the risk model and see whether or not they're still falling in that top, um, top percentile of risk. And then we notify that case manager to, to um, begin the process of discharging that patient from the program. In certain situations, there's still something going on with the patient and the case manager needs to keep them enrolled. Um, in some situations, uh, things uh, the patient hasn't reduced their risk, so they are um, staying in for a full other year in those situations. I think our program is a little bit different than certain um, certain other whole person care programs in that we've defined a very long uh, enrollment period. Um, traditionally, case management programs, someone is enrolled and the case manager works with them to uh, have them disenrolled at a certain period of time after three or four months. I think what, what some of the feedback from our leadership has been is that one of the limitations is sometimes someone's involved in case management services um, and then they're disenrolled from the program and then you know they pop back in three, four months later after they're receiving that support. So our program wanted to leave this long period so that someone might move into a maintenance, maintenance stage after you know six, seven months, four or five months even, but that they still have that point of contact with their case manager so they could get in contact with them if they needed any continuing support. Great, and uh, we'll take one more question. Um, are you, uh, this is from Aletha Merchinson, are you collecting utilization data? Actually, you know what, I'm get, Marie, I know that in a couple of minutes, we're gonna be diving in more deeply to utilization. So maybe we can go to the question, I think there was one about, um, well, there's two others, one about preventing falls and if there's information on that, and then whether you'd be willing to make your full approach available in terms of the questions and the objectives. So maybe you guys can hit those and then we can move on. Sure. Um, at least to the second question, I, I can't see the question about about preventing calls. But to the second question, oh, I, I think yes, absolutely. Will uh, I, I think we'd be happy to share. I think any of our our, our work with anyone else who's interested. So um, yeah, we have documentation and we have uh, you know a data model for how we collect it and are storing all this information. That would be helpful to anybody. Certainly, we would be happy to share it. That's great. So the question about falls is, um, are you doing or have any info, information regarding anything preventing falls among seniors as part of this? Um, I don't think that's, that is not something that we've specifically included. I think we're always looking for new things that, uh, to measure and new things that we, that, that, that we might be able to make an impact on. But uh, there's, there's not one of our measures that we have identified for evaluation. Great. Thanks. Well, uh, lots of interest in your evaluation approach, which is, which is terrific. So we're going to um, move on to the next section on uh, return on investment analysis, and I'm going to keep folks on their toes and uh, test your ability to, uh, to use the chat function. So um, we would just love to hear from all of you first before uh, Dan and Beth describe their own um, Community Connects kind of definition of return on investment for this program and hear from all of you. We'd love for you to describe, um, the, for those of you on the webinar, how are you defining or how would you define return on investment um, for a social needs program that whatever organization you're a part of might be involved in? So just a, a quick maybe bullet point or sentence about a definition of ROI for a social needs program. We'll give... Glad we're off the hook on this one. Yeah, we'll give a minute or so for people to respond. I think there's some messages coming in here. Um, and I'll just go ahead and, and read a couple of them as I'm seeing them. Um, so lower utilization of ED and inpatient services. Yep, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Total cost savings over expenses. Uh, better outcomes for chronic disease, such as lower A1C levels uh, for those with diabetes. Quality of life, reduction in absentees, et cetera. Great, maybe other ideas, maybe take a couple more. Yep, great, better chronic disease outcomes, triple aim metrics. Yep, achieving the quadruple aim. 
So I'm hearing some kind of shared ideas and themes and some of which I think you guys are gonna talk about. So uh, Beth and Dan, I'll turn it back over to you. Um, yeah, so, you know, essentially the, the whatever dictionary definition of a return on investment is just how much do you, does it, you cost compared to how much do you uh, invest in. Um, and so that, you know, that that's, I think, kind of where we have to start because that, that is essentially what we're trying to do here. We're trying to figure out how much we get for, for all of this work that we're putting into the program. Um, and so, uh, we kind of want to start from from a little bit of our of our change theory. Like, what do we think we're actually doing here by by investing in people's social needs by, by doing this social prescribing? And I think that uh, that kind of is helping us to to guide our thinking around how do we calculate ROI. Um, and and I think at least uh, what our what our basic idea is is that right now there is a there's a certain relationship between our, that our patients have between their physical health and their healthcare utilization. Um, and I think that the underlying, um, the underlying idea is that this, this pattern is suboptimal. And if people's social needs were better met, then there would be a better relationship between their health and their healthcare utilization. Their health would improve, their healthcare utilization would change. But we also know that, that healthcare utilization affects people's health. So there's kind of a circle that, that's always going on there between people's health and their healthcare utilization. And, and I think that the idea is, is that we, if we address people's social needs, we can kind of move into a more virtuous circle uh, in which people's health is improved, their healthcare utilization is reduced, and, and their social needs have been addressed. So we may be making progress on all three of these measures. And so we're, we're trying to kind of address each one of these measures in turn and say, well, what do we think we're doing for social needs, what do we think we're doing for their utilization, what do we think we're doing for their health, and how can we independently estimate the benefits associated with each one of these different metrics. Um, so, uh, and so this is, uh, you know, basically our ROI calculation, we kind of can think of it like some scales, we have some money that we're putting in on one side, we have program costs that are, um, so for our tier one patients um, who, uh, who get more face-to-face uh, interaction with the program staff, it costs 326 a month. For our tier two patients who are uh, primarily served telephonically, it's $146. That's, you know, that, that is the program cost. We also have some costs associated with our technology and other, uh, other investments that we've made, but, but in, you know, program maintenance, we can kind of estimate just as, uh, as our, our PM, PM. And then what are our benefits? Um, and as I, as I mentioned, there's kind of three things that we're going to talk about. Changes in healthcare utilization, improvements in health, and increased access to social benefits. And so we're going to kind of take each one of those in turn and just talk about how we're thinking about estimating the benefits of that. Great. So this delves in the question of healthcare uh, utilization. Um, the different things that we'll be looking at of measuring is basically all the information that we have in claims data. So this goes from our emergency room visits and our inpatient um, to things like our primary care and specialty care, AOD, mental health, skilled nursing. Because we do have an integrated health system where our health plan is underneath our county health services agency, we have a very good access to all this information um, on cost data. Uh, so we are very lucky in that respect. I think as we think about this utilization, um, there's inherently um, a difference between what we call kind of good utilization and bad utilization. And then there's a lot of uh, question marks of, of is that good or bad? So I think an easy way to reduce ROI is to just close all of our health clinics um, and basically no one would get services. And then clearly there would be a reduction in utilization, but that obviously is not an optimal way of promoting health. So I think when we're thinking about What's a good utilization? I think we talk about uh, visits to the primary care doctor being seen for ongoing mental health and substance use services. Um, when we think about bad utilization, we think about no shows and cancellations. So they're obviously impact negatively impact the health system. And then when we think about emergency and emergency visits and inpatient visits, it's really a question of it's not necessarily bad to go to the emergency room if you need to, but um, what's an avoidable emergency visit and what's an avoidable inpatient visit? So kind of looking at those um, metrics like the NYU avoidable um, emergency room metric or the HRQ PQI 90 about what um, could be dealt with in the primary care setting on the inpatient uh, area. 
So I have noticed there's a couple questions that have just come in. If it's okay, maybe we can pause for a second and address those. Um, so Michael Rothman was asking, given someone's social and medical needs, how does motivation and skills of the individual play into the risk stratification and the specific intervention? Um, so right now we don't uh, we, we don't have any um, any kind of uh, we're not measuring somebody we're not trying to estimate somebody's uh, quality of their enrollment I think is kind of what they're getting at whether or not somebody is going to engage with our case managers that's not necessarily something that we are trying to estimate beforehand um, mm -hmm. and include that into into our uh, uh, into our enrollment criteria. Um, I think it is something that we, we have thought a good amount about, and, and, and I think that we're going to have to, when we actually run our, our final evaluation, we're going to have to kind of control for the fact that some people are, are much more engaged, and we would expect our program to have an impact on the people who are interacting with their case managers in a way that, uh, that's not going to have an impact if you don't have any, any meaningful interaction with the case manager. So, um, mm. so we're not doing it for enrollment, but we are going to try to incorporate that information into our evaluation. Yeah, that, and I, I don't want to um, misinterpret Michael's question or, or put words in his mouth, but one way I read this is um, perhaps whether, which it sounds like the answer is probably no, but um, whether patient activation levels kind of coming in might be something that factor in so michael please correct me either pipe up in the chat or or um through the phone if i'm if i'm off base here but uh, that might be a direction where that question was taking us and then um we have another one about cost so adrian uh, nunez was wondering does the program cost include costs incurred for all services provided or only the newly added services in care coordination Sure, this is a great question, and I actually want to wait um, until a couple slides later where we get into this a little bit more full about when we're thinking about ROI, whose ROI are we talking about? Great. Marie, are there any hands raised or anyone uh, waiting to ask a question on the line? Not at this time, no. Okay, okay, great. So here is an example of another uh, program, how they looked at utilization. And we wanted to bring this up as an example of even in counties or health systems where they may have claims, they may not know the actual cost incurred, that there still are some things um, in the literature about how can we estimate these various costs. So things like uh, putting a unit cost for an ER visit or a community clinic visit. Um, that you know occurred. I think that there's also a number of things. Um, how are we measuring nursing home days, the cost for that, uh, providing legal services, jail units. Um, so I think that looking at a, how are we applying costs to these various metrics that may, we may not have information within our own uh, within our own claims data or within our own data set of how can we uh, actually still be uh, incorporating these into our ROI. Um, so moving on then to health, uh, these are some of the, the health outcomes that we're thinking about comparing between our control and intervention groups. Um, we have kind of some, some biometric measurements, we have HbA1c for our diabetic patients, blood pressure and BMI, kind of general stuff that we have measured on our population. Also immunization rate, cancer screening rate, um, some of the, the prime and the heat measures uh, that, that are kind of relevant towards individual health. I think we're also kind of thinking about uh, trying to incorporate those in. Um, the challenge has been from a uh, um, from kind of a, a measuring the benefits of this perspective uh, is that a lot of the a lot of the stuff that we see in the literature when you're talking about what's the benefit of additional health is really focused on on quantifying that benefit by reduction in utilization. And we already just talked about utilization. Um, so we're we're looking at utilization specifically. How do we how do we kind of get past the utilization based um, measurement of the of the of the um, you know the cost of health and into something that's more um, uh, that that more kind of acknowledges that health is is a benefit in itself and that when people are healthier we think that's worth it. That's why we're doing all this work. Um, and so that's been, uh, uh, I think that's just something that we've had on our mind. I know it's not something that we necessarily have an answer to, 
Um, we, uh, we've seen measures like uh, uh, quality adjusted light years, which um, is, you know, it, it kind of gets at some of, some of that issue, but it also is a, uh, it, it's also kind of, uh, we're looking at small, I think, effects on people's health, not necessarily things on the, you know, we're, this, we're not expecting this program to stop somebody from becoming significantly disabled or something like that. And in, in, in quality adjusted life years is a little bit more tailored towards large changes in people in people's health status. Um, so for these small changes that we do think have you know significant downstream measures, um, it's right now it's, it's a bit of an open question. And, and I think when we're talking about quantifying it, we are. Uh, I, I think we're we're basically going to have to move it to a different ledger book or something. We're saying okay, this is this is the, these are the things that we can measure from a cost perspective, and these are also the benefits in health that we can just say. Where, you know, we think we're going to reduce blood pressure by by this much, for instance, and that, um, and and then basically the people who are making the decisions are going to have to decide if that's perfect from a, from a monetary perspective. Um, we would like to move past that in, into some kind of more integrated way to put everything together, and would love to hear people's ideas about, about ways to do that. So moving on to social factors, I think um, one thing that this program really wants to be looking at in our evaluation is what is the impact on signing people up for uh, CalFresh, CalWorks, um, in-home support services. So each of those are things that we could tie a dollar value to. We could know someone's um, uh, monthly benefit for CalFresh or CalWorks, and I think that's one thing we're working on with the data sharing agreement with our human services department about how to actually get those member benefit numbers. We talk about housing assistance and, you know, if we're tracking days in shelter or housing placements made, uh, those are things that we're able to track through our HMIS system. Um, again, it's a question of what dollar value would we be placing on something like those? And so kind of working on, uh, looking at the literature, how might we measure that? When looking at criminal and legal, we might be looking at evictions avoided, reductions in arrest, fewer days in jail. Again, kind of putting a monetary value on kind of what are those societal uh, values. And then we have a number of other smaller uh, social benefits that our program is providing. So for instance, um, job training. We might be uh, helping someone get um, clothing for a job interview or uh, providing someone uh, who access a food pantry. So again, it's kind of looking at what are all of those other social benefits that, that this program might be providing. Uh, could we be placing a monetary value on those and essentially um, including those within our kind of community benefit of calculation? So I wanted to talk a little bit about how ROI is inherently tied to the reimbursement method. So I think when we think about a return on investment for a health system, um, we mentioned this earlier, but it's the question of who is the payer. So I think in a health system where it's primarily paid for on a fee-for-service basis, um, you're basically getting uh, paid for every emergency department coming in, is a reduction in that emergency visit actually an incentive? Uh, is that actually um, helping that ROI for that organization? And I think the answer is obviously no. Um, so I think as you go along this continuum of different payment methods, you know, you have pay for performance methods, uh, shared saving methods, all the way to a full capitation with the health plan where um, those people who have the risk, who are holding that risk, are really the people who are benefiting uh, from these ROI initiatives. I think in Contra Costa County, we are a very lucky health system in that, you know, our health plan is integrated into our health system. So for all of our uh, CCHP members or people who are enrolled in our health plan, if we are doing this part of social case management of showing cost savings, it's really benefiting our health system as a whole. We, of course, do have those um, fee-for-service patients who are enrolled in our program, so it, I mean, that would be considered potentially um, a negative impact on, on return on investment, obviously a good impact on health. But I think that as we think about ROI, uh, we really do need to think about who the ultimate payer is and, and where we fall in this continuum of different health system or health plan um, in how this initiative is paid for. And, and Beth, on that point, maybe just drilling down a bit, because I know that, um, you know, many systems or practices, depending on participants and kind of what type of organization they're a part of, um, probably have a mix of different payer types all at once. So just curious about um, 
you know, your advice on, on uh, the approach for the ROI when that's the reality, right? You have kind of a mix. Like, how, how do you think about this at, at a more granular level, I guess? Yeah, and I guess the question in my mind is really who is doing this ROI analysis? Is it is it an ROI for the state or is it an ROI for the health system or is it an ROI for the health plan? So I think that, um, you know, I think each of those organizations and players in the health system, you know, we need to be thinking about how are we maximizing ROI and that sometimes they're in competition with each other. And uh, as, as this discussion of, a whole person care um, an effective program, I think it's inherently linked to how is it paid, how, is, how are we paying for whole person care. So I think that um, right now we can kind of, as a pilot program, we can look at ROI in a very um, like general sense, but I think that the discussion needs to move on to how are we actually paying for the program so that we're aligning those incentives across the players. So as we get into this uh, next slide, I think we kind of are um, discussing this in the same same sense is that kind of who is benefiting from from the case management services uh, through whole person care. So when we look at contra cost of health system, we are an integrated health system. So we look at our program costs very simply. We're spending two hundred million dollars for whole person care. We'll know that there's a benefit based on a reduction in uh, utilization of across the health system because we are integrated, we can measure that. Uh, we also can look at our reduced no-show rates to be determining um, if our program is saving money. If we're able to uh, retain Medi-Cal, I think a big thing we're looking at is churn within our system. If we're able to keep people enrolled, we're able to maximize those revenue streams. And then also, if, if any of our uh, technology enhancements have kind of improved efficiency. So I think that there's a number of measurable um, program benefits, but then there are also some indirect costs. So potentially, um, like we said, that there is this mixed payer. So we might have decreased billable health because of our fee-for-service fee -for population. Counties that don't have this integration with their health plan and they're under a separate umbrella, I think that's an indirect cost, of, and that's going to be calculated within the ROI that, that you're looking at. When we talk about Contra Costa as a whole, a kind of community benefit, um, I think there's additional program benefits. So things like permanent housing, enrollment in public benefits, reduced jail days, those are all things that we can be measuring um, as a benefit on the numerator of our ROI. So then there also are those indirect costs. So for instance, our program might be signing people up for general assistance, which is a cost on the county. Um, we might be uh, providing strains on other safety net health systems. So how are we measuring that? I think it's a big question of, you know, are we just kind of passing around, just passing around patients and how are we kind of measuring those other financial strains? Um, and then when we, you know, kind of step back and go a little bit wider and we, then we think about what the cost benefit is from the state perspective, uh, I think things change, change a little bit at the, uh, DHCS is, is paying half of our program costs, that's $200 million, and uh, you know, the, uh, the reduction in healthcare utilization, a lot of those benefits do kind of eventually accrue up to the state, also kind of reduce duplication across the health system um, is, is kind of a large-scale benefit. Um, but we're also, uh, I, I think in theory, shifting a lot of the, the healthcare costs outside of the, uh, it, it's a different department and, and, and those costs will be kind of formed by the state. If people are getting their care elsewhere, that care will, will also have to be paid for. And, and as we, we look even wider, if, if, these, uh, if we're moving people on to CalWORKS or CalFresh or um, IHSS, those are additional costs that are borne by the state kind of uh, even more widely. And so, uh, Really depends. I think the point is that it really just depends on, on where which balance sheet you're looking at, um, which uh, uh, what you think is a cost and what you think is a benefit. It gets I think kind of complicated relatively quickly. Um, so just to delve in a little further in contra costa, um, I think there there definitely are considerations like what is the cost. What is the ROI of the program, federally speaking, or on the state side? I think for the purpose of our evaluation, that we're really looking at those internal cost savings. So things along the lines of reduced no-shows, Medi-Cal retention, more efficient use of the healthcare system. 
system. And then those expenses being things like um, our staffing and benefits, our capital, our technology enhancements. Uh, we do have member benefits, like we're paying for cell phones for patients, transportation vouchers, legal aid, patient services. Um, we have mail and printing and mileage reimbursement. So these are all included within our PMPM rate. Uh, but these are things that we could potentially um, sell out to be examining a little bit further. Um, and then we also have, as well as making the argument that this is a worthwhile program to uh, to our health services, we also kind of want to make the argument to our community at large um, that this is that this is a worthwhile thing that we're doing. Um, and we can then kind of talk about the more general benefits to the community, the amount of money in per month that's coming uh, that's coming into the community because of increased access to benefits, the amount of money that we're that we're saving by potentially reducing jail days or, or um, securing more housing for our population. And, and also, I think we can then kind of start to make the argument that there's some multipliers to these, uh, to these dollars, that an additional, you know, an additional dollar in CalFresh um, can actually be worth some multiple of that to the population. And people have tried to estimate these things and incorporate them into the uh, into kind of the return from these programs. And I think when we're talking about the community at large, we can start to use those multipliers. Um, and then I think there's even kind of a further way that we can go. We, we really think that some of the benefits of this program are going to be very downstream. And, and it's kind of so far downstream that they're just not, you know, it's not really possible for us to measure that. Like, what is the, what, what's going to be the benefit to a child who now has access to enough food because their parent is, is now on couch. Um, those are, are extremely, you know, we think that we think that it's meaningful. We think that it is important, but we, uh, you know, we basically can't really, you know, estimate what that benefit is. And so um, I think then we, we're kind of moving kind of off of the balance sheet, and then we, we're talking about kind of public relations. If we can say we're doing something. Um, we and we can when we have some evidence that this has happened, then we then we kind of. Uh, uh, kind of have to make our argument from a different perspective. Um, the perspective that we think that this is, uh, that we think this is worthwhile because because we know that it's having this impact, even though we can't count it. Great. I'm going to jump in here and just see check in with Marie to see if there's anyone um, anxious to ask a question, either raising their hand or we've seen anything come through the chat because this has been some great information about ROI. So I want to pause for questions. Uh, nothing uh, as of yet through that conversation. Okay. Well, maybe I'll throw a question out because I, it does sound like the further downstream impacts of this is something that, um, you know, there's a desire to try and capture, but not um, really don't know exactly how. So, um, I would love to throw that question out to, we have a lot of people on this call and they maybe try and um, harvest some of the wisdom of the participants uh, about their own ideas or their own experience, um, capturing some of those kind of further downstream impacts or longer term impacts, either in a social needs type of program or even other um, programs. So any, any responses to that question or, or other questions as well? Oh, and I do, I do see one uh, the question coming through from Michael Rothman. Thanks, Michael. So how is the program learning along the way, day by day, week by week, to make the program better? Uh, asking kind of about a continuous improvement approach. Great question. So we do have a whole quality improvement department uh, within Community Connection. Part of the uniqueness about how whole person care has been organized is that um, our inherent PDSAs are, are incorporated in the deliverables of the state. So I think it's really forced counties and forced grantees to incorporate this into the process. And I think it's been excellent because it's required us to put staffing there and really kind of create that as a culture. So I can say we've, we've been doing uh, numerous um, quality improvement projects. Anything, um, I just came out of one where we're looking at how are we documenting as a health system? How are we documenting the case management program? Is it really working for our nurses and our behavioral health staff? So trying to figure out how are we documenting um, chronic disease? How can we change that? How are we doc documenting substance use? How can we change that? 
Uh, we've done a number of other quality improvement projects looking at our social needs screening, seeing how we can better, um, better identify patients and talk about needs. Uh, we've done other quality improvements on high risk notifications, uh, providing key centers information about when a person's coming out of the emergency department and how can they uh, get in contact with them quickly to kind of work on those things. So I think it's been uh, incorporated into our daily um, processes and really trying to figure out what's working and kind of um, kind of trying to move our eggs to the correct basket. That's great. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, so I wanted to end with a little bit of a provo provocative question is, is ROI really um, the end all and be all measurement? And, you know, we wanted to ask is, is the high, R high ROI really the most important thing for a program to be measuring or is it the cumulative net savings of a program? So uh, going through this chart, I just want to kind of walk us through and kind of think about this question. So when we think about the, um, the people in our program. So we, we risk stratify everybody. So we have our top 0.1% of people. It might only be 150 patients, but we definitely know that they're most likely going to be having a high risk event in the next year. We're basically holding everything equal and saying, um, how many events did this program avoid? How much did it cost? We have an estimated growth savings of, you know, we estimated that for a very high percent, we saved $336,000 as a program. Our program cost uh, $400,000, so actually we made a loss, so we have a 0.8 for ROI, hypothetical numbers on all these. As we think about scaling our program, let's say we, we want to target the top 1% of our program. So you can see moving across our cumulative net savings may have increased to 925,000, moving our ROI to 1.46. Should we enroll more patients? I think this is the question of what is the scalable size of a program and what should it be? So if we say let's enroll the top 5% of the program. Moving across, our cumulative net savings may have moved up to 4.3 million with an ROI of 1.55. But should we go up to 10%? You know, if you can see, the cumulative net savings will actually increase, but the ROI will uh, decrease to 1.35. So I think as we're thinking about what uh, percentage of people should we uh, enroll in the program, um, you know, I think it's a question of is ROI really the most relevant measure? But should we be looking at the cumulative net savings, um, trying to maximize the percentage of um, maximize the number of people in the program to uh, maximize that net savings. Um, so yeah, in conclusion, um, I, I think that uh, we're really grateful for the opportunity to, uh, to kind of do this work. I think it's uh, really interesting and, and uh, one thing that we kind of been great about this is that Community Connect has, has a number of uh, advantages. We're a large well-funded debt study with a dedicated evaluation staff. Um, we're designed kind of with evaluation in mind, and we have uh, integration from both the IT perspective and, and the financial perspective. Um, that being said, our estimating our ROI is still really hard. Um, we focus a lot of our energy on utilization, and that's because it's countable and, and it's quantifiable. And we can, you know, and that and that makes it um, easy to do something with. Um, but quantifying exactly what the, the benefits of our, our health and social work is, that's it, it, still a work in progress. And I think it's something that we're really going to need to incorporate in order to make the, the final argument that this is a program that's worth continuing. Um, and uh, and it's the final thought is that it's and we think it's really important to pay attention to who's paying the cost. Um, and we want to tie the gains that we're realizing from this program to the same balance sheet that is, that is um, you know, paying those costs so that, so that people's incentives are aligned. Um, Great, thank you. Uh, and we've just had a flurry of questions, I think, come through. So um, here we go, we will start uh, and Marie, let me chime in here if I'm missing any, but I, I've seen a couple in my chat box. 
Um, so Adrian is wondering how are community-based nonprofit service agencies so in the community at large that are a part of integrating people into healthy communities like Meals on Wheels or community centers a part of the process or not? Uh, do they slash should they play a role? So a great question. So um, yes, they definitely are a part of the process. Our case managers are referring out to a number of different uh, CBOs. So I can say our database of social service referrals is over 2,000. So you can see the vastness of who is included in this. And I think the challenge from an evaluation side is how can you possibly claim the value on 2,000 and track 2,000 different um, organizational referrals? I think from a documentation standpoint, one thing that we've worked hard to do over the last uh, few months is providing some discrete data elements within our health record to be tracking things. So we don't necessarily need to know which specific food pantry you went to, but did you go to a food pantry and did you actually access that, that resource? Did you uh, get referred to a meal delivery service like Meals on Wheels and did you actually access that? So I think at the end of the day, um, with how we've changed our documentation, we should be able to be providing a pretty discrete list of um, the number of resources that our patients have accessed and potentially uh, identifying some sort of dollar value for those so we can be calculating that in. I think that's um, nice in theory and I think we'll, we'll yet to be determined if that's going to be possible in practice. And you know, I think it's largely dependent on the quality of the data, the documentation, obviously, when you're working with 150 case managers with people documenting, um, you know, I think the data quality is, is a question, question is probably the biggest question on, on the evaluation side. Mm -hmm. And, and then there's a, another question that is asking actually about a specific population, a specific resource and whether that's included. So I think it's Lolitha Murchison, um, sorry if I butchered your name, is asking, are you working with homeless veterans and or other housing organizations to expedite the housing needs? Um, sure. So we work with our H3 department. Um, I think housing is an issue everywhere. We live in the, we're located in the Bay Area, so obviously um, there aren't enough, uh, there are not enough housing options. Um, we are working with our uh, homeless, homeless division to be working on housing. I think one thing our grant has worked in is we have um, uh, payments for people, uh, for four person care, they can't pay for rent for uh, for patients enrolled, we are able to help with moving costs, so we can pay for down payments, we can pay for moving. Um, so I think that, you know, this last week we uh, provided um, $400 to someone who was right before he was been homeless for five years. Uh, he was going to get housed for the first time in five years, and when they ran his credit report, um, it came out a little bit lower than he thought. So he uh, was $500 short on uh, his down payment. So that was something our program was able to intervene in and actually uh, provide for, um, for him. So I think that there's been some like really unique things with our program. Um, great stories to tell, I think, you know, quantifying them is a challenge. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then another question. So Gloria Montiel is wondering, is there a way to measure or estimate? I think you've, um, we obviously talked about this earlier, but the health impact of this social approach. So for example, could there be a study that shows a certain decrease in hemoglobin A1C correlates to a certain percent decrease of complication? So, and I think that evidence is out there for different clinical quality measures and just wondering maybe, what, you know, how or whether you, you guys have incorporated those. Um, well, I think that that is still definitely a work in progress. Um, at this point, we're, we're kind of focusing our energy on, on seeing if we can uh, change people's HbA1c, and, uh, and, and I feel like that's kind of, that, that's our next step, or our future state is to be able to say, well, if we've done that, how does that, how is that really going to impact people's lives? But right now, you know, besides the basic idea that, that it's better for you, and we, we know that there's evidence that it, that it does in, you know, it's a meaningful measure of people's health, uh, we don't have uh, And I think, you know, just piggybacking on Dan, I think one thing we do have an advantage of is um, our health plan data. And so we do have all of our heatest metrics that we can yeah. be tracking for our entire, or a large portion, about 85% of our population is a health plan member, 15% are fee-for-service um, dual. So for 
that population, we do have um, the ability to kind of pull on that data set, which will, will be helpful in looking at that. That's great. We'll look forward to, to hearing the updates. And then a um, couple more questions. So uh, Marie, you just um, get the hook if we're running out of time here. But Teresa Wetterman is wondering, is your ROI analysis based on savings for one year? Theoretically, sustained improvements in health will have longer term cost savings, but they could take many years to realize. I think right now our time horizon is as long as the program lasts. So we have, I think we'll probably eventually have four years of follow-up for, for some, uh, some members of our population. Mm -hmm. And we will incorporate as much information as we can. Um, that being said, you know, one year is our kind of our program length. And so I think the bulk of our information is going to be, going to be looking at what the short-term changes are. Um, I, I think that, that that's really identified one of the, the key challenges with with um, trying to do this this type of work. Um, the longer term cost savings are going to take a while for for us to actually realize that, and we are going to need to make an argument for program sustainability before those cost savings have been realized or estimated. Um, and and so I think if we message that and we say, okay, you know, we, we think that this is um, we think this is going to have more benefits down the road. Uh, we can make that argument, but in terms of, of really counting on it or being able to demonstrate this is exactly what the program effect has been, uh, I, I think that's probably you know, kind of outside of what we're going to be able to do. Yeah, and I think just uh, in addition to what Dan said, I think this is I think the big difference about working on evaluation from inside a health system as opposed to as an academic you know, looking at a research study of a huge program and that, you know, we need to be looking at what are the effects pretty pretty soon. I mean, we're talking, we're already at the end of 2018, 2019 is coming on and the program funding ends in, 2019, in 2020. So um, we do need to be looking at this now so we can basically be determining what parts of our program are going to continue or be making a case to different funding streams um, that this is an effective program knowing that, you know, in an ideal world, we would have a longer time frame to be looking at the effectiveness of the hours longer term. Yeah. So I'm going to apologize to those of you whose questions we didn't have a chance to get to, but we have two minutes left. And I do want to ask um, if you could respond, because I'm, I'm sure there's people on this call that are kind of just starting their journey, um, and you both are much farther down the road. So what would be your piece of advice to those folks that are kind of undertaking, just starting to undertake this work? Good question. Um, I guess uh, my first piece of advice would be to get all the players at the table. I think it's probably the most important and something we say all the time, but sometimes we don't do it. Um, I think it's you know, getting everyone involved in what everyone wants to be looking at and measuring and then setting up that scope of work, um, knowing that not everything we want to look at, we can. And I think that's um, something that, you know, we have to have that conversation with with um, senior leadership in our health system, um, with uh, different people working on the ground, is that, you know, there's a million things you should be looking at with this health system and or with this program and what is really most important. and letting everyone kind of feel part of the process of narrowing down that scope. Yeah, and I, I think I would just kind of reiterate that, that, um, you know, being clear from the very beginning that you can only do so many things and identifying what your priorities are and sticking with those priorities and saying that we want to be able to do at least one thing really well um, mm -hmm. and focus on that um, is because as you kind of get into this, there's, there's a lot, there's a million different questions. Um, about trying to measure the impact here, and you and it's just not possible to do all of them. So if you kind of highlight what is the strength for you, what what you think you can do, I would stay focused on that. Great. Well, I'm going to thank you both so much. This has been uh, fantastic, and I think uh, Marie just has a couple comments to close us out. Yes, thank you all so much. I want to start just by saying um, thank you to Beth and Dan um, for speaking on behalf of Contra Costa County and uh, Health Services and the work that you all have been doing. Um, and thank you, April, um, for being our facilitator today. So I just want to remind everyone on the call that this webinar um, is recorded. We will send an email early next week with the link to the recording, and it will also be posted on our website. Uh, please feel free to share this resource widely with your networks. 
Uh, we're looking forward to having you all on our second ROI webinar featuring efforts from Kaiser Permanente on February on, fr on Friday, November 30th. Um, registration information will be posted on the website in the coming weeks. You can also sign up for our newsletter um, to get updates on CIN, CIN work at chcf.org slash CIN. So thank you all so much and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.